another penis related video so soon, I hear you ask. Yes. <laughs> hey Spuds, how's it going? It's Jamie, welcome back to another video, your first video on the channel. If it is your first video you're watching of mine, that intro bit must have sounded really odd. And if you didn't watch my previous lower surgery video, it also must have sounded odd. But context, less than two months ago, I made a video talking about the realities of my lower surgery experience. I'm a transgender man, I had metoidioplasty lower surgery. I will leave a link below to the previous video if you want to go watch that first after, whenever. You don't have to watch it at all. If you don't want to, you can just watch this video. But anyway, I just did a little update about like, yeah, this is how things are going with my new penis, which isn't so new anymore because it's like 400 bit years old. And I also said, if you got any questions or anything I didn't cover in this video, then please leave them down below in the comments. And guess what? You asked some questions. Thank you very much for asking some questions. So I am back because I didn't want to leave too long between saying, ask questions and I will answer them and then actually answering them. So I'm back today to answer your questions about my lower surgery. Oh yeah. So let's just get going. But I would recommend that if none of this is making sense and you don't know what lower surgery is or bottom surgery, Rheumatoidioplasty to go check out the link that I've left in the description box. Thanks for sharing, dear. You're welcome. I do have a question out of pure curiosity. Ooh, I hope I'm not being rude and you don't have to answer this. I'm not gonna lie, that whole build up is like, oh dear, where's this going? Do you still get your period? Oh, that's a perfectly fine question because as far as I know, bottom surgery does not include a hysterectomy. How do you spell getting a uterus yeeted? Oh my god, uterus yeetius. I love that. Uterus yeeted is a hysterectomy. Great question question, actually. I don't find that rude at all, personally. So bottom surgery can include having a hysterectomy because then it saves you needing to go under anaesthetic multiple times, but it's not a necessity. It's, you don't need to have a hysterectomy to have bottom surgery. The only time you would need to have a hysterectomy is if you wanted the vaginal opening to be closed. Obviously, everything would need to be removed first, and then it can be closed over. But for me, I did not have a hysterectomy, but having a hysterectomy is not the only way to stop periods, so I don't have periods. Testosterone typically stops periods from happening if your levels are high enough and there are also other methods that you can take supplementary to stop your periods if testosterone does not achieve that for you. Hey Jamie, hello, I have a question. Thank you. Feel free to not answer if you aren't comfortable doing so. You're so polite. Did you go through the NHS for your transition treatments and surgeries? I have a non-binary kid who has just been referred to the trans... oh. Why did it cut off? I'm sorry, I don't have the rest of your message. Cute though, I love supportive parents and you asking questions, I think that's fantastic. So for me, my whole transition, so hormones, top surgery, lower surgery, in terms of like the physical side of things, was a mix of private and NHS. Very quick rundown, I got approval for testosterone and my initial appointments privately, but then I get my prescription on the NHS. My top surgery, I also went privately for. My lower surgery, I pursued quite a few years after my top surgery and after starting testosterone and I went down the NHS route. It took a lot longer because the NHS wait lists are a lot longer than the private wait lists. But yeah, it was definitely a mixture of private and NHS for me. That's something that quite a lot of people do, like depending on financial situations. Some people will go completely through the NHS, some people will go completely privately. Other people will maybe start hormones privately and then do all surgeries through the NHS. You say that ideally you would ideally have a cis penis. Could you make a video talking about how you were able to come to terms with that? I want bottom surgery, but the fact that I will not have a cis downstairs makes me want wonder if it's even worth doing. I'm gonna answer it in this video rather than its own video. I think in terms of coming to terms with that and accepting it, it's a personal journey for everybody. So just because I could do it doesn't mean that everybody will be able to do it. In terms of how I did that, I guess for me personally, I was just able to accept things that are not within my control. I still recognize what my ideal situation and what my preference would be without letting it get me down for like 99% of the time. There's always the occasion moment where it's like, no, oh, okay, well, I'm a bit sad now. But a majority of the time, I'm totally fine because it's like, Do you know what? I can't make that happen and it's fine. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with me. And I think that was really important to just recognize there is nothing wrong with me. There is nothing wrong with that. It doesn't make me any less of a man and it might not be my favorite situation, but I can't, I can't change it. All I can do is my best with the situation that I've got. And I know that is not a mindset that works for everybody or is achievable for everybody. So I'm not being like, hey, I did this so you can do it too. That's just my personal journey and thought process and what helped me with 
of it. I would also say that in terms of like being worth it, it's about improving your life and improving things for you rather than reaching perfection. So if you think it would improve things for you, maybe it is still worth it. But if it would not make any improvement, then maybe it's not worth it. But it's all a personal journey and it's something that you can take as much time as you need to take to figure that out for yourself. But yeah, I wish you all the best and thank you for asking a question. Would you be comfortable sharing more about what went into your decision for Metoidia versus phalloplasty? I did, I made a whole video about this and I've linked to the bottom surgery playlist in the description box. So it is within that, just like literally, why did I go for metoidioplasty over phalloplasty? But the simple thing is, is that I was happy with the sizing results in metoidioplasty, I didn't feel the need to pursue the like average size penis in phalloplasty and I didn't want the scarring personally. That's pretty much in a nutshell, but I do go into a lot more detail about some other things in the video if you want to check that out. I expected more info on sensitivity, use and dysphoria. Sensitivity is fine. I have full sensation. Um, use is something that's personal to me. In terms of metoidioplasty, there can be size differences that impact like specific uses if you catch my drift, but like specifically for me, that's a personal thing and that's like my boundary of sharing online and not wanting to share online. I am happy, okay? <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say. And in terms of dysphoria, it's it's all a very personal thing. For some people, it will help dysphoria a lot. For some people, it won't help as much as they expected. For me, it helped my dysphoria a lot more than I expected. I was kind of shocked <laughs> by how much more comfortable it made me feel. And yeah, I'm just, I'm I'm overall very happy with it. Yay. Wait, you can't pee standing up? Rip off. Kidding. <laughs> but I am kind of jelly about the standing up to pee thing as a cis woman. Okay. If you specifically wanted that ability, would the fallow option allow it? Or would you have to craft yourself something like one of those shiwi funnels, but give it phallic decoration? I hope that's not too intrusive of a question. You can ignore me if you want. Okay. Yeah, I can't pee standing up because I didn't get my urethra lengthened. So it's in the original position that it was before. You can get your urethra lengthened both with metoidioplasty and phalloplasty so it goes through the penis and you can pee standing up. Occasionally people who have metoidioplasty still struggle standing to pee um, because of sizing and like fly clearance. So like public standing to pee might be difficult at a urinal. If you don't have bottom surgery, you can use something called an STP, so a stand to pee device. It can range from being like what you would expect with a shiwi type device, uh, just like a kind of funnel type thing, or it can look like a very realistic penis. Fellow trans dude here, hello. I was just curious if you went for a vaginectomy as well since you hadn't mentioned it. Ah, um, no, I think I mentioned it earlier in this video, but no, I did not go for that option. That would have meant needing to get a hysterectomy that I did not feel the necessity to have and it's very major surgery and I just didn't want to do that personally. About how long did it take after surgery to be pain-free? Longer than I wanted it to. No, <laughs> I was gonna say I'm kidding, but I wasn't. It was longer than I wanted it to. It was relatively painful for quite a while. The bruising was intense for a good few weeks. My memory is slightly fuzzy because it was four and a half years ago, but I definitely do not think it was within a month to be pain-free. Yeah, very sensitive area to have surgery on. I was incredibly bruised. I had to have two operations, so I don't know if that lengthened my recovery time at all, but it, it was very, it was a very difficult healing process that took a lot longer than I would ever have wanted or expected it to. I have a question about mechanics, if that's all right. If you didn't get your ethyl lengthened, and your labia majora was sewn together to form a scrotum, if that's how they do it, yes. Um, then your urethral opening would be hidden inside your closed scrotum and the urine would be trapped. Since that's obviously not the case, I've made a mistake somewhere. Please correct me if you feel comfortable doing so. Thanks. So, anatomically, the urethra sits behind every, like behind the, the labia, so it's like the behind and then the scrotum is formed and then the urethra is still just like chilling in the back and everything's kind of like brought forward as much as it possibly can be when they do metoidioplasty. So yeah, the urethra is like just chilling, totally fine, totally free, not enclosed in any kind of scrotum situation. It's all, it's all good, just behind, like a queue. <laughs> it's at the back of the queue. It's not at the back of the queue. It's in the middle of the queue. Oh, <laughs> I think it would be helpful to discuss sensation. One of the main things people worry about, is it the same, different? Do you lose specific sensations? Okay, so I very, very lightly touched upon sensation earlier. <laughs> touched upon sensation. It can vary for people, um, the sensation you have after surgery. Like in terms of top surgery, I don't have like the biggest amount of sensation in my nipples in certain areas and stuff because things are just detached and sewn back on. But with metoidioplasty, because it's not a skin 
graft and nothing is like detached and reattached. It's all just kind of like reconfigured. I've personally had very little change in my sensation. I would say it's actually the same. Like I personally, the scar tissue is always going to be a bit different, but the scarring is minimal. And then sensation everywhere else is pretty much the same as I can always remember it being. So it's just not been an issue for me. That is all the questions for this video. Yeah, if you've got any more questions, let me know. If you like this video, let me know. Think about giving it a thumbs up and subscribing, but there's no pressure to do that if you don't want to. And yeah, as always, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Much love. Bye.